So a PCI is a brain-computer interface. It's an interface between the brain of the user and an external device. Uh, it allows the user to communicate or to control this external device without using any muscles. Uh, so if you think of the usual way that with which we uh, communicate or use a computer or other devices, they all require some kind of muscle activity, even speaking. Uh, I mean, right now I'm using the muscles of my chest, my tongue, my, my mouth. Well, in a brain-computer interface, what we want to do is really just using the neural signals directly. In real life, I think PCIs uh, will be very useful in two, let's say, very far areas. One, obviously, for disabled people, people with uh, a severe degree of paralysis and uh, similar situations, they will be able to control devices like wheelchair, uh, hoist for the shower or something like that. For people that are not disabled enough to benefit from the technology, there would always be a niche in the games industry uh, and in nowadays people are so accustomed to using gadgets and devices of, of all sorts that I believe they would also want to use that technology to control the environment eventually. Uh, but I see it that realistically within the next couple of decades in the game industry I think we're going to have a huge growth of PCIs. So a VCI can be used to uh, replace current interfaces that we use to uh, control devices. So if you think of a keyboard that we use to type on a computer or a mouse, a joystick, pedals, they could in principle be replaced with uh, direct brain-to-device communication, uh, which will then allow us to use um, our hands and, and, uh, and our body to perform other actions. So it's like it can be seen as an augmentation of the possibilities that we have to uh, communicate and control external devices. I think that in the future, the fact that we will be able to control things just with our thoughts, uh, unconscious PCI control, so for example, you remember you left your lights on at home, uh, and then your brain signals will be sent to a computer somewhere, that we process that information and turn the lights off without you having to actually do anything. I think that with BCI, as it becomes more usable, uh, be better performing in terms of speed and accuracy, people will start seeing it as, an, as a technology that frees, up, frees us from other uh, duties. Uh, they will see it as an amplifier of our abilities, like the car is an amplifier of our speed, or a crane is an amplifier for our ability to lift uh, heavy weights, then BCI would be an amplifier for our abilities to perform actions um, in, in, a, in a fast and user-friendly way. Um, there would be a point where we would be able to perhaps input data uh, faster than a person can touch a screen, um, or, and, and perhaps uh, move cursors and control commands uh, faster than we can do with, with our muscular uh, movements. So at that point, I can imagine that people would, uh, would be happy to spend a little bit of time uh, putting the, the electric, electric caps on uh, in the morning and then benefit from this additional speed and control provided by the BCI. No, it's not possible. Uh, with BCI we can uh, uh, interpret very uh, simple uh, um, uh, commands. Uh, we can uh, see whether a person has recognized a particular stimulus. Uh, people can uh, learn to um, modulate some specific activity in the brain. Uh, we can perhaps see if a person is certain or uncertain about a decision. Um, however, uh, there is, well at the moment, there is no way that we can see exactly what a person is thinking. We, can, we cannot say uh, whether a person is thinking, I would like uh, uh, some vegetables versus I would like some meat. 
that's not possible. So the kind of BCIs that we study here at the University of Essex are called non-invasive BCIs, meaning that the, the, the signals, the neural signals that we record, are recorded non-invasively from the from the skull, from the surface of, of the of the head, and uh, there's actually um, absolutely no no risk, no hazard involved. And of course, uh, one one of the possible risks associated may be, uh, let's say for example that um, the BCI, the user is trying to achieve some kind of action and the BCI misinterpreted and that misinterpretation causes some damage to a third person. Then in that case, who's responsible? The user who wasn't able to communicate with the BCI, the BCI that misinterpreted or the designer that uh, wasn't able to make the BCI accurate enough. So these are questions that we will need to answer one day in the future. Yes, yeah, so, well, actually, it's a great area. I think that's the main message. The main meetings at the moment, there's uh, three, but there are more coming up. So there's the uh, grass meeting that has been running for uh, a long time. There's the uh, Silomar meeting in the U.S., which started at first as a separate meeting only by invitation, and eventually they opened it up. Uh, and there's always a BCI meeting or a couple of sessions in the IEEE Neural Engineering Conference. As far as I know, there are no actual expos. So uh, a BCI is a, a system which is made of a hardware side and software side. So from the hardware point of view, the, the, the BCI is made of a recording device like an EEG recording machine connected to some kind of uh, computer or other um, processing uh, hardware. Uh, on the software side, what, what happens is that the signals is first pre-processed in order to remove uh, strong artifacts. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, when by blinking your eyes you create an electrical activity which is a whole order of magnitude higher than the tiny neural activity that we try to record. So pre-processing is, is the first stage. Then feature extraction, meaning that we need to find measures um, that are meaningful for the, for the machine, that carry the information about the neural activity. And finally there is the decoding phase, where um, a machine learning algorithm tries to find the signatures of the neural commands that the user is trying to, to send to the machine. And finally, the, the commands are sent to the actual device to be implemented. Let's say a uh, wheelchair to turn to left or right or to move a robotic arm. Yes, of course. Uh, in principle, any, any person can use a, can use a BCI. Uh, some BCI, some ways to control a BCI require some form of, of training, meaning that the performances in, in so by performances I mean the, the speed, the accuracy with which the user can communicate with the, with the device increase over time and can be learned. Uh, other devices can be used in virtually uh, no time. Um, of course, uh, I mean I said that anyone can use it but we've seen in the lab that some people are more good at it and some people are, uh, have uh, at first at least some uh, more difficulties but uh, nothing that cannot be overcome with, with further training. But, uh, typically BCI is used to um, control external devices, wheelchair computers for example. However, um, um, more recently um, we have started seeing BCI as um, a potential way of uh, improving people um, perception or uh, uh, improving the ability to make decisions. In certain areas like uh, decision making for example where uh, we've been able to show that with groups of people connected to the BCI we can beat um, equivalent groups of people not using a BCI in terms of accuracy and speed as well.